welcome to Let's Ask a Theologian, a gospel center program where we interview evangelical scholars and theologians for the equipping of the saints. I am your co-host, Joshua Olivares, with Jonathan Olivares. And on today's program, we'll be discussing the Gospel of John. What is the Gospel of John about? What contribution does the fourth gospel bring to biblical theology? And what does the author desire to present Jesus as in this fourth gospel? Well, today our theologian is no stranger to this gospel. Matter of fact, our theologian for today is the senior pastor of Hope Church in Roscoe, Illinois, where he has been pastoring since July of 2014. He received his B.A. from Trinity International University, his MDiv and THM from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and his Ph.D. in New Testament from the University of St. Andrews, Scotland. He had also served for nearly a decade as a teaching professor at Talbot School of Theology, Biola University in Southern California. He is also the author and co-author of several books, such as Understanding Biblical Theology with Darian R. Lockett, The Local Church, What It Is and Why It Matters for Every Christian, The Sheep of the Fold, The Audience and Origin of the Gospel of John, and his notable commentary on John in the Zondervan Exegetical Commentary series. So that being said, without further ado, let us welcome our guest for today, Reverend Dr. Edward Klink. <laughs> Dr. Klink, it is a pleasure and honor to have you on the program with us today. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Praise God. Now, before we dive in into the Gospel of John, Dr. Klink, maybe you can share with us and the audience on how you came to know the Lord. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was raised uh, in a Christian home by the grace of God, uh, raised by a single mom, right in the same community in which I now pastor in northern Illinois, uh, and was just very involved in a local evangelical free church. The EFCA is a, is a denomination in the U.S., and uh, I'm, I'm part of that. I pastor in that now, studied at their divinity school. But the Lord was gracious to me with a mom that was connecting me to church, with a local church that ministered and guided me um, and grew in my faith, had a desire to serve in some kind of ministry, even as a child, decided to go to a Christian university to study. And, and the past just went between the academy and, and, and the church and really a hybrid of the two up until this point. But just so thankful for God's provision of a, a family and a nurturing local church context in which I could grow in the faith. Wow, praise God. And I'm sure that would be very encouraging for those who could relate uh, to that type of background. And uh, on a personal level, Dr. Kling, I would like to thank God for your life because as you had mentioned in your author's preface, there is already so many uh, commentaries on the Gospel of John, um, such as Carson's, Kostenberger's, and etc. But uh, when I started reading yours, especially when I got into the preface and all the way through to the sections of the commentary, what really stood out to me and even touched me is your great concern for the pastors, that you were writing this, that you were thinking of pastors um, as you were doing your commentary. And that really touched me and edified me. And um, not only that, but as you're breaking down the text, it's so clear. The depth is there, the research is there, the exegesis is there, and it's so readable and accessible. And for that reason, I want to thank God for your life, and uh, we want to encourage those who are going to dive into the Gospel of John, please do get Dr. Kling's uh, commentary on this Gospel. So that being said, let's begin with our introduction on the Gospel of John, Dr. Kling. And uh, the first thing we'd like to ask is um, authorship. Who is the author of the Gospel of John? Uh, because there are some who suggest that John did not really write the Gospel of John. So maybe you can uh, give us an insight on these very issues. Yes, I mean, there, there's a lot of different questions surrounding the authorship of the Gospel of John. Although, to, to, to be honest, uh, I would say that, and I mentioned this in the commentary, I, I hold a confessional approach. I just, so there's a, there's a confessionalism that argues that the tradition in the history that the church has presented is something that is reliable and an interpreted tradition. Uh, usually the debate comes down to which John, as long as you're some kind of within the realm of orthodox theology, is, is, it, is it John the son of Zebedee or, or John the elder? 
Uh, and and I, I'm just convinced of the traditional view of the son of Zebedee. In fact, I think in the first seven verses, really verse 2 and verse 7 in John 21, that n- not a perfect precision, this is obvious, but just making it so clear that John, the son of Zebedee, is the author of the book. Mm-hmm. I, and if I could make a comment on that. For sure. The Gospel of John loves anonymity. Mm-hmm. And I think when we think of anonymity, we, we can think of it in a negative sense, right? Like an anonymous statement on a blog post or anonymous letter of complaint, right? Where they don't want to be known. But actually, anonymity is a, is a literary feature, a function that tries to communicate in a certain way with a certain emphasis. G- give you examples from the Gospel of John. Uh, we would have no idea that the name of Jesus's mother was Mary if we didn't have other Gospels. Mm. Uh, there are numerous key individuals in the gospel story that are completely unnamed. The, the blind man, who is 41 verse chapter, is unnamed. The lame man in John 5, even uh, the obvious, the beloved disciple, right, is clearly, it's a literary feature. Mm. So all that to say, the fact that the gospel withholds an obviousness uh, in regard to an overt obviousness, a, a blatant obvious is not because he's trying to deny or minimize that John the son of Zebedee is the author. I think at the in the last chapter is where it's most clearly revealed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think the reality is he's posturing himself less as his own individual person and more as an ideal witness, mm-hmm. right? He wants to be perceived from the perspective of a witness. And only at the end of the gospel does this witness get carefully introduced so as to not eclipse Right. His role. It wasn't his identity. It's not his fame. It's not his apostolic status that is significant. His significance is that he is the one who witnessed, who saw these things, like the beginning of the letter of First John. We saw, we, 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 we witnessed, we, we beheld, right? We beheld his glory. That is the emphasis. And the anonymity focuses on what was seen, not the who did the seeing. So right. all that to say, as much as there that leaves enough room, especially in our modern day, for wrestling with authorship, I think there's just more than enough historical, ecclesiological, uh, historical evidence for John, the son of Zebedee. I think the gospel itself kind of directly, in, in a strong way, points to that in verses 2 and verse 7 in chapter 21. But I wouldn't want our listeners to miss the important role that anonymity plays that might be a little foreign on our modern ears. Mm, thank you so much for that. That's very insightful. Now, in regards, Dr. Kling, to the provenance and the traditional or given date for this letter, what would that be? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, people are going to debate in general uh, when the gospel was written. And I am, and I, I wouldn't even want to call, I mean, I did my dissertation that you read on the audience and origin. That sounds like I know what I'm talking about. Um, But my whole dissertation engaged with a hermeneutical debate going back now over 50 years that views the Gospel of John as written for an insular insider community. Mm. So you'll often hear in John studies about the Johannine community and and, and a very gifted scholar named J.L. Martin who was taking off from the work of Rudolf Boltmann argued that John was this secret, almost code book of an insider community. It was never something meant to be widely distributed. And if you read it carefully, you can read between the lines and see a history of a Johannian community. Mm-hmm. That, that reading dominated for a long, long time. And part of my PhD work was alongside other scholars, was to try to dismantle that, to argue that the gospel, in in a book written by my PhD supervisor, that the gospel of John was actually written for all Christians. Mm -hmm. It wasn't some insider document. Now, there can be debates on exactly what particular year or even province is there, and the realm would be in that reasonable gospel gospel written time in that later late first century second half of the first century historically connected to the historic apostle john i just think that's just a very faithful understanding of when it was written and why the biggest challenge though is that idea of the johannine community mm-hmm. and even the and, and at least in scholarly realm that that is an ongoing discussion but i really think the gospel was intended to be written for the church for non-believers uh, for people to have an eyewitness testimony of who Jesus was and what Jesus did. And ultimately, as the title of the book is, 
what the gospel is. Um, and that's the most significant part, I think, for us to understand. Mm, thank you so much, Dr. Klink. Now, if I may insert along the lines, um, is it would it be accurate uh, to say that the fourth gospel, as some would call it, is an evangelistic or spiritual gospel? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, some have tried to argue. One of my teachers, D.A. Carson, has tried to argue that it was primarily an evangelistic gospel. I, and, 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 and certainly spiritual gospel, it's rightly been called. Those are technically, I would think, two different senses. Mm -hmm. Some have tried to argue that the whole purpose of the gospel, as the purpose statement says near the end, is that it was for people to believe. Mm -hmm. um, and even there, the grammar, the, the, the Greek language is a textual variant, arguing is it about that they may come to faith or that they may be continuing in faith. And and I maybe I'm maybe I'm sounds like I'm punting. Um, but I, I just think the word of God and the gospel of John has been used for all those purposes. Mm -hmm. In one sense, it is a beautifully clear presentation of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Uh, and it does so in a rich way. In other places, it is deep. Mm -hmm. It is very theologically dense. It is it, it very literarily complex. Irony and, and, and themes running through from start to finish that are hard to pick up on a first read it, it's it, there's a shallow end but there's a real deep end too that could maybe have somebody say well is that really for beginners or the newbies yeah. uh in one sense yes mm -hmm. um but in another sense maybe not and, and and so that's why this spiritual gospel as it's been called really for centuries is really speaking about the fact that it is a theologically rich gospel right mm -hmm. um and it's canonically fourth right it's the final fullest formative theological account of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ and the deep work of the gospel of his ministry. And I think that's fair to say. So I guess I'm, regarding to what you asked, I'm a little hesitant to simply say it's clearly evangelistic, but I'm all for saying, yes, it's a spiritual gospel, very theologically rich gospel. I think it's great one for, early, for new Christians or the seeker to read, but I think that the veteran Christian and skilled Bible reader could spend months studying the gospel and find themselves not even touching all the edges mm. of its of its richness. Amen to that. Well said. Thank you. Now, for our next question, when we look at the overall structure of the book, when looking at the theological structure of John, how should one break down its chapter divisions thematically? Yeah, I I, I think that is hard to know. Um, I think it's fair to say, even from somebody who's written a commentary, uh, that sometimes it's, it's, it, it is an act of interpretation. Uh, the, there were no chapter divisions. There were no verse divisions. It, there weren't even the earliest manuscripts spaces between the words. Like, it's hard to know how to break it down. I, I think it would be clear and obvious, and, and my commentary goes into this, that the, the gospel begins with a prologue and ends with an epilogue. And I, I think that's obvious. And there's and no one really is debating that, although a few in certain ways, but we're going to debate everything, aren't we? Where I push back is what has long been kind of the standard for maybe 75 years at least of the twofold division of the gospel between the gospel of sign, the book of signs and the book of glory. Mm -hmm. I actually don't find that, uh, number one, as helpful. Mm -hmm. And I also worry that it could be driven by source criticism. Mm -hmm. The traditional argument is that it was a signs source, mm -hmm. hence the book of signs, the signs source that was utilized to by John to author the gospel. And a hundred years ago, a little more source criticism, form criticism, redaction criticism was, was well up and in play. And mm -hmm. there's benefits and values to those kind of critical analyses. I'm just unconvinced. Boltman and, and really C.H. Dodd were the main proponent. I mean, Dodd's major books, you know, back from the 50s and 60s on the Gospel of John, really cemented Book of Signs and Book of Glory. I am just unconvinced that it's that clearly distinct, as if it's almost two volumes. I think those themes are running all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, I even think, to be honest with you, again, the debate is what's the seventh sign? I would think the seventh sign is the resurrection, mm -hmm. which clearly wouldn't limit the, the signs, the resurrection of Jesus, 
would limit the signs to only the first 12 chapters, but would it actually include uh, chapter 20 as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I break it down, and I say this in my commentary, it, it can be hard to know. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think inside of the prologue and the epilogue, I, I break it down into thematically eight additional chapters, so a 10-part structure. I think the first chapter is really doing first week kind of imagery, the first week of Jesus' ministry. That calculation might sound a little odd on the second day, on the third day. But when you realize that the gospel is emulating the book of Genesis, mm. now it makes way more sense. Mm -hmm. right? It's it's actually trying to pause that the entire ministry of Jesus as the re a, a retelling of the creation story. So the, so for me, the first week is its own section. But then if you kind of break down the next few parts, you have the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, where really he's going from region to region, Jewish to Gentile. Uh, you have the confession of the Son of God, some legal debates with the religious authorities that really make clear who he is. You have controversy over the Son of God, where the, the, the battles and discussions regarding him are in full play. And you even have the conclusion of his public ministry. And then the, really the last half of the gospel is the farewell discourse, uh, which is a phenomenal kind of long sermonic form of seven statements that Jesus makes. In fact, when, when I preached to John, I called it Christianity 101. Mm -hmm. Like, here's what you're going to face. Here's what you need to know. Here's what the Christian life is going to be like. Here is why I'm leaving and when I will come back. Like, all mm -hmm. of those things are declared. And then the final parts of the of the book are the, the crucifixion and then the resurrection ended by the epilogue. Now, I, I just don't think I, I, I have to hold those anything but loosely. I think somebody could, could break it down to the eight sections instead of ten, and I'd be like, yeah, that's, that's fair. Because mm -hmm. you're trying to determine the subject matter of the text, letting the text determine the parts. The biggest push I would make, which is against some of my dear brothers and sisters who've written, even some of my former teachers, would be the, I would push against Book of Signs and Book of Glory. That's the part that I would be less wanting to be influenced by and say, let the, let the textual subject matter of the Gospel of John itself help me determine what the structure is. Mm, very good. Thank you so much. And uh, we greatly appreciate the fact that you approach it that way, especially for our viewers and those who listen, um, who are intimidated, or maybe even for the first time reading the gospel, coming to salvation, and just um, how am I supposed to divide up the book, but to let the Holy Spirit's words or the words inspired by God speak for itself. And, um, and the Lord will reveal, as you said earlier, it all comes together. Um, uh, just moments ago, you were speaking of the uh, beauty of the Gospel of John, and and again, everyone looks at the Gospel of John and says it's you know it's the beginner's book, it's the most simplest. But at the same time, there are great depths to it, which makes it, uh, you know, some may say it's difficult to approach. Um, and so they kind of focus on John, but then in relation to the Synoptic Gospels. Um, how is one to view? Because what I, what we do not want is that the Gospel of John is set up here, whereas the other three Gospels are looked down upon, or the other way around. Um, and so what is the relation that the Gospel of John has with the Synoptic Gospels, and, and why do we consider three Synoptics and John not part of it? Yeah, I, I, I that's a great question, and I think that same impulse that I kind of have concern over regarding the division of John between the Book of Signs and Book of Glory, glory that same impulse is behind separating the Gospels as well. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have no evidence that there was they were ever circulated in distinction from one another. Right. Right? The earliest evidence we have is that it was a fourfold Gospel. Fourfold Gospel. So what would then make us, in, 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 in more recent times, without denying that even the early church noticed greater similarities between the synoptics. Again, the word synoptic, optic, eye, seen, sin with, seen, seen with, seen together. Mm. Um, but I think biblically, theologically, from a confessional standpoint, there are four Gospels of Jesus Christ. Right, right. And even their titles are significant, right? Mm. But every title is Gospel According To. Right? Gospel according to, and that's significant. Gospel according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. And I think we can get so snagged on the historical origin or the ordering or even the interrelation. And to be fair, John is 
less than 10% of John is directly related in, in like literary comparison with what you see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But, but part of my impulse would want to say, I want to minimize that a bit, right? I want to see the fourfold collection as having great significance. I want to argue there are eyewitness, these are four eyewitness testimonies, apostolic in origin, seeing different perspectives. And I even want, if I can play a theological card, which I think is confessional Christians, we can, that God is involved in these in this fourfold account. Mm-hmm. And we can get so snagged in that, well, what, what actually happened? And maybe a category that might be helpful for your listeners is the difference between reading the reading a gospel as a text and reading it as an event. Mm-hmm. And I have a, I worry that in our modern historical era, we kind of read them as events, mm-hmm. as if we want every gap, every detail. If it was just a camera recording, that's what we're looking for, where these are actually, yes, they're clearly historical. They're clearly being accurate, but they're 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 aspects of interpretation. Mm-hmm. They are being interpretive. Yeah, yeah. They're intentionally interpreting. Meaning, when you're doing an interpretive telling, you are there's a ton of details you are leaving out. Yeah. Like I didn't mention the street I grew up on with a single mom. Mm-hmm. I didn't mention the kind of color car she had. Mm-hmm. None of that was relevant for my telling you about me being raised or how I came to faith in Christ. The Gospels take complete freedom to hone in on details that they want to hone in on, that the Lord wants us to see and know without filling all the gaps. And I worry sometimes our historical mind, which is what modern scientific analysis over the last couple of centuries has kind of driven us toward, Mm -hmm. are fighting to fill in the gaps. And sometimes we even want to just uh, the Dia Tesseron, combine them all into one gospel to mm. know exactly what happened. And I'm not sure knowing exactly what happened is ultimately God's greatest concern. Exactly, He wants us to know what the most important things are or yeah. why something happened or who is doing the happening and what that means for us. And there might be other historical details that are actually minimized or left anonymous. I'll, I'll talk about that in another example maybe in a few minutes, that would seem like that'd be good historical data that the gospel doesn't give because it's trying to give something else. Uh, I'll, I'll give you this example. In John 2, when John, there's a very weird scene at the wedding in Cana where the mother of Jesus basically asks Jesus to come and provide some wine. And his response to her is kind of interesting. He uses the word woman, which, man, <laughs> if I said that to my mama, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> um, so that's already that's already off putting, and that's there. There is something part of that, like yeah. as much as it clearly the sinless Lord was not sinning against his mother, but he was classifying. He was he was putting up a bit of a barrier, hmm. and then he actually capitulates, but he says it in a way that tries to distinguish the purpose. Uh, for what he came to do, even if he's able to capitulate ultimately or to follow through or to use it to fulfill that same purpose. And I actually think that's why she's never named, right? She's never named anything but mother because the contrast that the that the Gospel of John wants you to see is that while Jesus has an earthly mother that has demands of him, that has expectations, that wants him to do things and even serve her in certain ways— It's the heavenly father under whom he is making sure he fulfills his purposes. And that story already sets up that little contrast. So by leaving off her name and giving the category of a mother, it beautifully shows that by the end of the gospel, it was always the father's will, not the mother's will. It was always the father's will that the son would fulfill his duty and glorify the father. And also the father would give all authority over to the son. But you're seeing that becomes significant. And so why did John not name? We know it's Mary. The other gospels tell us, I mean, church tradition tells us, we know it's Mary. Why? Because the point was not to give you her name as it and more data, mm. but to want you to see that the mission of the, in that very first miracle, the mission of the son was always be defined, not by what the people think he needs to do, exactly. not by what the world thinks he needs to do, not even what his own biological mother thinks he needs to do, yeah. which in an ancient culture is a big deal, but mm. what the father who sent him thinks he needs to do. Yeah. Now there's a thick reading, isn't it? Of actually what would be less information. We didn't even get her name. Because it was her role that was the most important thing that the gospel wanted us to get. 
Mm. Um, so the beauty of the gospel in that way is that those are the kind of things that if we get too snagged on the event, we can actually miss how the text is guiding us in key ways to understand what the Lord himself wants us to hear. Amen. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. And really, uh, I love that because, uh, again, as you said, in our day and age, especially with the amount of commentaries that are accessible to us, we can get lost and um, uh, others say get lost in the bushes, um, if you will, and 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 lose sights of of what the Lord Jesus says in John 10, my sheep hear my voice. And really the focus is on the plan of God and redemption in Christ. And uh, we really appreciate how you highlight that, uh, the word of God. Um, earlier, you had mentioned its relation or at least its great similarity to the book of beginnings or the book of Genesis. And the gospel of John opens up with in the beginning. Now, a lot of people may not see that parallel right away, uh, but uh, could you just elaborate or just uh, touch on that? Uh, why does the gospel of John open up with in the beginning? And uh, how are we to understand that? Yeah, I mean, th this is one of the themes in the gospel that I think was the most striking for me, I think I picked up on aspects, but I, do, you know, and words and phrases, like I think it's pretty clear when you see in the beginning, but it can be hard to know what to do with that. Yeah. Um, but the gospel is actually trying to do a couple things. First of all, it's giving a perspective, not from j just ancient Israel. It's actually trying to give a, it's almost like the gospel of John is starting on the, uh, on the edge of Saturn and wanting you to look at the planet Earth and then slowly bring you in so that you can see. That's really what the prologue is trying to do. It's, but it also is theologically trying to present Jesus as, as the fulfillment of all of God's creative purposes. Like Jesus is clearly presented as the second Adam. Jesus is clearly presented as fulfilling the works of creation, new creation. And let me give you the best example of this. It's so beautiful and easy to miss. Uh, John chapter chapters 18 to 20, right, which is really the, the garden scene, the arrest and betrayal of Jesus. Chapter 19 is the crucifixion. Chapter 20 is the resurrection, right? One of the things you, you might miss is that there's like an inclusio, meaning there's it, it's framed with this anonymous garden. The very first verse of John 18 is that there was this garden that that, that they're in not that, that the disciples are in now, now everyone knows it's gethsemane it's not, it's like it's a big mystery the synoptics have told us that why is john not telling us and calling it what it is why does he say they went to a garden right and and, and, and part of the interesting interpretation is our temptation is to fill that in well, what, what was that or i remember even reading one commentary that's saying ancient gardens were usually square and there was a it's like it's describing <laughs> the historical reality of gardens <laughs> no, I want to. I want to argue, and I'll show you this in a second. The gospel doesn't want you to think of a mere historical garden as much as there was one, and they were in one. It wants you to think of the biblical garden. Yes, yes, right, the biblical garden. Let me prove this to you. Right after he's crucified, John nineteen forty one, literally right after he dies, the text jumps and says, "And nearby there was a garden." garden. And it's like, um, so now the betrayal is in a garden, and the death is in a garden. Mm -hmm. And that beautiful image is meant to be playing off the garden from the full biblical story, right? If in the first garden, the garden in Genesis, death came out of life, mm -hmm. in the second garden, the yeah. garden in the Gospel of John, life came out of death. Wow. There was a betrayal. There was a sacrifice that was needed, and it gets better. When you get to the resurrection story, Mary is there, and she sees Jesus. But when she first sees him in verse 15 in chapter 20, the narrator tells you what she was thinking. And it literally says, thinking he was the gardener. Wow. Now, why does God want us to know what she was arguably wrongly thinking mm. because in one sense he wasn't the gardener that's jesus yeah. he's not just some landscaper doing some weed whacking but in another sense yeah yeah he is the gardener yes amen the gardener in his garden mm. there's the new creation 
Mm-hmm. There is the renewal of the creation. And when you just go to the end of the biblical story, when you go to Revelation, what do you see? You see the original garden cultivated. It's a garden city. You could literally have a kid's book and talk about the Bible as a story of three gardens. The garden in Genesis, the garden in the Gospels, Gospel of John, and the garden in Revelation mm-hmm. shows the whole trajectory of the biblical story. Now, why does John not really care if you know the size of ancient gardens <laughs> when you read verse 18.1? Why does he not really care to even name? In fact, naming it would distract you. It would make you think of the it would make you think of the historical garden of the first century and not the biblically historical garden in the first chapter of Genesis. Now that is a theologically rich reading, isn't it? But it all fits with this creation, new creation theme that goes from the beginning to the end of the gospel. And, and, And it just it continues on, by the way. I mean, if I could just say when Jesus breathes on them and says, received the Holy Spirit, that's exactly that's exactly what God did when he created in humanity in the image of God. He breathed into dust. That's new creation, right? So all those themes, we now have spectacles to see tons of creation, new creation themes running through the gospel that in the beginning is basically like the appetizer to say, strap in, boys and girls, because you're about to see the whole creation story in the life and ministry of of the creator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And what I love about that and the way you broke it down is the fact that because it says in the beginning from chapter one, we don't have to uh, go into the book of John and and say, oh, it's a far-fetched idea because the first verse tells us in the beginning, it's giving us as what you've just said, and we shouldn't miss that at all. Uh, We appreciate that. Uh, now, the Gospel of John speaks greatly about the Lord Jesus Christ, um, and in many ways, uh, the Lord says of himself, I am, and so follows his description of himself. Uh, can you speak on these I am statements that are quite unique to the Gospel of John and um, the significance to every believer? Yeah, the the Gospel of John gives seven, I call them formal I am statements, where it's I am the, and there's seven descriptions, bread, bread of life is the first, light of the world, there, there, there's, there's several of them. Seven is significant. I mean, it, it fits that creation theme. It, it, the Bible didn't, you know, ancient books didn't have underlining italics, circles. But it, it's kind of numerical significance and repetition was a way of a neon sign kind of significance. Um, and the seven I am statements do that. In short, the, the seven I am statements are emphatic descriptions and 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 the self-revelation of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. They're descriptions of his person and his work. And, and it would be a study in and of itself. Like you, you could literally just take the seven I am statements and really say, not, not that it's necessarily fully comprehensive, right? All of God's word is needed yeah. to describe all that God wants to say. But it's a beautiful description of the particularity of the Son of God, His work and ministry in the world, mm-hmm. um, and they're rich and, and and they're and they're loaded. They're symbolically loaded. Like when Jesus says in, when, at the funeral for Lazarus, his friend, Lazarus's sister is kind of challenging him, and Jesus is saying, you know, she's he's trying to comfort her, and she, she responds and says, "I know that He will rise in the last day." And then Jesus says, "No, no, 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 I am." Mm-hmm. I am the resurrection and the life. Those are loaded terms. And part of me even wants to say, like, thinking pastorally, right? Like each of those terms are like a hyperlink. Like you double click on it and each of those I am statements are just like loaded with the theology of the Bible about the nature of resurrection, which is future, but the nature of life, which is present. Mm-hmm. And somehow the present life and the resurrection future are interlocked in the person of Jesus. And so Jesus is saying, speaking pastorally for a second, I don't just want you to believe what will happen. I want you to ground yourself in the person who is those things, who is the resurrection and the life. And each of the I am statements and key parts of the gospel unveil the self-revelation of who Jesus is and what Jesus does. And they're beautiful. And I'm not even sure they're meant to be simply encapsulated like you can put them in a container and say here's the first time statement put it on the shelf they're they're meant to be expanding in their impact yes in their meaning in their significance uh, if i can share personally my wife is on hospice right now 
Oh, she's been battling this horrible disease called ALS for three years. Mm. Uh, about three years ago, next month, she started to have symptoms in her body where she was falling, lost use of her right arm. And she has a disease called ALS. It's sometimes, at least in the States, called Lou Gehrig's disease. It's a disease where basically your brain neurologically disconnects from your muscular system and you lose all your muscles. Mm -hmm. So right now she cannot move. She can't scratch her nose. She can't feed herself. She can't dress herself. That's That's been the case for a long time now. And she's literally in arguably the last four or five months of her life. And we still have one kid in college, two kids at home. Uh, I mean, she's only 49 years old, as am I. I mean, we're late 40s and we're already talking funeral. Mm. And when you go through something like that, it's one thing, even as a pastor, to have officiated numerous funerals and to deal with people who are dealing with suffering, and, and, and you feel that pastorally. It, it is another thing, unavoidably, when it's your wife of 25 plus years mm. and the mother of your three children, two of whom are still, one of one, our youngest kid is still 13 years old mm. um, and is, is mourning the loss of her soon to be lost mom. The reality is when Jesus says that he's the resurrection of life and he's he's interlocking present life with future resurrection, it's more than just a doctrinal statement that I assent to. Yep. It has to be something that Jesus ministerially, even as we could talk about in this gospel, uh, by the ministry of the of another paraclete, right, the, the spirit, mm -hmm. embraces us and reminds us the reality of the new creation has already begun mm -hmm. and is so significant. And that's where those I am statements are meant to be like pillars yes, yes. that not only describe the self-revelation of Jesus Christ, but depict the reality of his ministry, that he satisfies everything we could need, bread of life, that he makes sense of all that there is, light of the world, and that even a horrific disease like ALS with your wife is literally understood and manageable in light of the fact that he is the resurrection and the life. And so those realities of these seven I am statements become very pastorally significant. And yes, they have great theological significance, self disclosures of Jesus Christ. But I, but I would want to try to argue for those listening that they're very pastoral as well. Yeah, yes. And to not miss that about the gospel of John. Oh. Amen. Well, I mean, we are so thankful to the Lord and how you are such an encouragement to us even this evening um, and how you are comforted in the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, even it, with the present context. And certainly we'll be praying for you and your wife and children, Thank you very much. Um, the ministry, of course. And um, and what I love about what you said is that, as you uh, as you mentioned, these statements are not just for us to hold doctrinally to merely assent sure. to. And even the context of that John 11 passage is he was speaking to a woman who was in distress uh, at the loss of her brother. And so you cannot avoid but apply that pastorally. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. And so we are not just to hold on to something, but to actually sure. see its application at the present of who Christ is. And, and so um, we are so comforted and encouraged uh, by you, uh, brother. And, uh, and certainly the present reality of the Lord Jesus Christ in which he has made known to us today, um, we will see its fullness on that final day. That's right. That's um, right. Now, the Gospel of John speaks greatly also about uh, Jesus as the Son of God. I mean, he uh, describes himself as one, uh, as the Father's only Son. Um, now, there is, of course, with false religion taking it out of context, and yet even for those who don't understand why he's called the Son of God, why, if he is God, why would he be called the Son of God? Is there two gods? Or um, what's that significance uh, yeah. found in that gospel? Why is it even mentioned? That's important. I mean, the, the gospel really is careful to emphasize the sonship of Jesus Christ. And th this is where we, we have to look at this confessionally. Yeah. Um, we have to, we, ha we, we let all of Scripture, I mean, just kind of basic principles of interpretation. We let all of Scripture help us interpret any part of Scripture, right? We, we, we're, we, we think even creeds and confessions are helpful interpretive lenses and guides to understand or to, to, to summarize what the Bible is was saying about things. So coming to the Gospel of John without growing in or understanding the doctrine of the Trinity would make it hard because it's a very Trinitarian book. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And yeah. it's just assuming that God, he, he, from the very beginning, very first verse, right? There is one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And, and the sonship of Jesus is really, really significant. The little example, uh, in, in verse 12 of John 1, in the prologue, it, it's trying to talk about how the work of God is to create, right, uh, children of God, right, sons and daughters of God. And the Greek word there is technotheu, children of God. When we are spoken about, we being the church or the children of God adopted by the Father, it's always technon. It's always, it's always technon in Greek. When Jesus is described as huios. So in, in 112, it's technotheu. In 134, when, when, the, when the Baptist proclaims, it's he is the huios theu, son of God, children of God, son of So that, all, that I can be a son of God, but Jesus is the son of God. Right. And all of that is moving us into what really the whole Bible needs to speak to is about the doctrine of the Trinity, the nature of the second person of the Trinity in particular. And John gives a huge um, does a huge amount of work to provide the church with a disclosure of who is the second person of the Trinity, what is the nature of the second person of the Trinity, how do we understand the second person of the Trinity. But he doesn't do all the work. The rest of Scripture does. But what John does is signify that there are many sons and daughters, but there is only one son, capital S, mm. and that is Jesus Christ. Mm. Um, and the fullness of the gospel articulates this second person of the Trinity, and the sonship language is significant. Now, again, other biblical books speak to that as well, and that, that just gets us in the biblical theology, yep. doesn't it, or systematic theology even. But John just does a whole lot of work to to be definitive regarding there i'm a son of god but jesus is the son of god and that's just so significant right now for somebody who has not yet read the completion of the scriptures or you know J john is their first book they've opened uh why is that important to a son of god uh without yeah, having the... to eliminate from their thought that he's literally you know well he is um but Again, does God have a son? What is? How are they? Yeah, that? What What you discover in the Gospel of John is that, I know that in the rest of the Bible as well. Maybe the pastor in me, right? The, the Johannine person likes to just limit it to John, but the pastor can't but be yeah. a generalist in a sense, right? But John does a lot of work to describe. Uh, what, if they are both equally God, and you bump into mystery here, and you bump into things that are beyond our pay grade and part of a part of talking about the trinity is simply acknowledging i am talking about something i'm unable to fully understand and that's not that's not the punt that's actually just to submit mm -hmm. right i i'm not god therefore i cannot articulate and define and fully grasp god without denying that he has revealed self-disclosed what he wants me to know and submit to that the father is the one who sends the son the son is the agent of his ministry yes. hence we're hence we're called Christians, right? Christians, because it is the Son and through the Son, the mediating work of the Son, that the Father accomplishes what He wants to accomplish, even if the Father sent the Son. But but then the but then the Spirit is ministering, and the Son had to leave, which He declares to the disciples, and that the Spirit is ministering, but fully in collaboration with what the Son was was going to do. Mm -hmm. That that becomes really important. I'll give you, let me give you a pastoral example. I was teaching at Biola, and I, which is a, the college and seminary I was at in Southern California. I sprained my ankle playing basketball, and I'm walking to class on crutches, trying to get to class through a crowded hallway of college students. And a student sees me and says, oh, quick, 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 let me pray for you real quick. Let me pray for you. Okay. And she kneels down, squeezes my wrapped ankle. <laughs> uh, I grimaced a bit, but tried to be polite. And she prays to the Father for my ankle to be healed, which I very much appreciate, even though I had three minutes to get to class. Then she stands up and goes, oh, two more. And I go, two more. And she kneels down, and she squeezes my ankle again, and she prays to the Son. Mm. And then she stands up and says, one more, as you know. And she kneels down, squeezes my ankle, and then she prays to the Spirit. And she walked away, and I went to class. And I was thinking to myself, she prayed to each of the persons individually. Mm. But notice, notice, what we're often teaching our people to pray, we close a prayer with a little phrase that often says, in Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. Now, when we pray in Jesus' name, we are praying in Jesus' name not, not because Jesus is the only mediator between us and God the Father.
Mm. So in a sense, we're we're praying through Jesus to the Father, but we're not praying through Jesus or to the Father without the empowering, guiding, uh, accessing ministry of the Holy Spirit. So instead of having to pray to all three individually as if they're not coordinated, Mm. when we say our Father who art in heaven, we're praying to all three because the Son is doing the mediating work that is so significant. Gospel of John frames that emphasis. It frames the significance of the Son for the Father sending the, the, the life of the Christian, right, in Christ, in Christ, that's Paul's language, but John would like it very much, and through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. That's the significance of the Sonship of Jesus, that in one sense could sound very biblical, theological in John, but in another sense is very pastoral. So when my kids were little, we say we... In Jesus' name, we pray implicitly. They're learning that it's to the Father, mm-hmm. through the Son, and by the Spirit that we're able to pray. And in John twenty, when Jesus is sending his disciples, he says, "And he says, as the Father sent me, so I send you." Notice it wasn't the Father sending us; yes. it's the Son sending us. Right. That we are participating in the larger ministry of the Son. Hence, we are not fatherins mm-hmm. or Holy Spiritins. We are Christians, Mm -hmm. and that's because of the significance of the ministry of the Son that even the Gospel of John spends a lot of time to articulate. Amen. Uh, uh, And we appreciate that, everything you've said. We appreciate everything you've said. (laughs) Um, And uh, I think just moments ago when you said that uh, when Mary's name is not given, it is to focus on the Father's will um, in sending his son. Um, and really, that qu- the next question I was going to ask is, how does the Gospel of John highlight the son- sonship of Christ? And really, if we just use that as the lens uh, to read the Gospel of John, we'll see that the entirety of the book is of the Father's will um, in his son. Mm. Now, right. everything you've said uh, gives us great reason or great understanding uh, with regards to the Gospel of John's contribution to the entirety of the Scriptures. Um, but what does the fourth Gospel bring to biblical theology? Yeah, I, I, I think I think it does. I think it does a lot of things. I think it it does. It, it, there are several major themes that the Gospel is a primary voice in. Um, again, I, you're going to hear my sensitivity to want to be always canonical. Yes. Just because yeah. we're confessional, right? So we're not isolating the gospel uh from, from this, but 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 in this canonical choir, the gospel has a core tenor part, or whatever you want to call it, yeah. uh, of communicating reality of the gospel message itself, the specific ministry of, of Jesus and who Jesus is. It, it, it may be one of the most maybe I'm always leery of saying that, but it's clearly one of the most significant books on Christology. The nature and, and 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 ministry of Jesus Christ. It has a huge theology of the Holy Spirit. That is a whole other conversation. That it, that I think is significant, and I even think it talks a lot about the Christian life. It, it, I, I mentioned earlier the farewell discourse could be just called Christianity One One. I mean, it really speaks a lot to the Christian life and the nature of Christian discipleship in in, in some rich ways. Uh, um, and so, you, so you 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 ultimately see, I think, that the gospel speaks on that. And and what we've already talked about is the creation new creation theme. I mean, I, I would want to argue that that is really played out in the gospel in a way that's super significant. So that by the end of the gospel, you're seeing Jesus his all his appearances are on Sunday, right? The new creation, then the beginning of the next week. The, he is the second Adam. You know, borrowing from some of Paul's language, but it fits. Like yeah. all of that is there for the new creation and the new covenant work of Christ. And those biblical theological themes are everywhere throughout John. Amen. Mm-hmm. Praise God. Now, before we transition, Dr. Kling, to our random questions round, since you have discussed for us and unpacked in such great detail and in a theological manner the gospel of John, for someone who is about to dive into this gospel, and they're hearing this now. They might be thinking, man, I, I wish I would be like Dr. Clink. He understands so many things concerning John. I don't think I'll ever get there. What encouragement would you be able to give the reader 
who desires to learn something about the gospel of John. Now, the, the posture of a Christian disciple may be the most important thing. Hmm. Um, we can be so driven to know more. Yeah. And if we're not, and that's, that's not a bad thing in and of itself, but it's, it's a posture of learning. It's a posture of submitting. It's a, it's a posture of being formed. Because what I worry about, and may, maybe this is in the Western context, numerous resources we have, we can be, we can almost be addicted to knowledge. And I see this in the church. Like you can have people that they just know a lot of Bible trivia. Yeah. But have they been Bible transformed? Mm, Man, I, I would just say uh, relax on that com- competitive drive, but be a just a thorough student of scripture. Somebody says, I just don't read that fast or takes me more time. Is there a race? Like who's running against you? <laughs> like be just a I mean, what's the just be a disciple. Right. That sits in and under the word of God, that learns and grows, um, and 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 I, I feel that for myself as as I, like I shared, our, as our family goes through a really rough time, I'm being formed in ways that the Lord is using in teaching and and humbling and breaking me of things. That is actually what it means to be a disciple, mm-hmm. is to be transformed uh, by the knowledge of God's word and the reality of the work of Christ in us. So I would just simply say, relax. Be faithful, be consistent, and watch your posture and study it with diligence and do it in community, do it in your church family or with others and enjoy the richness, but apply it, like let it form you. And if that has to slow you down because it's not just a game of trivia, then let it slow you down. Yes. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much for that. Now, in respect to your time, Dr. Klink, as we transition now to the random questions round, there are two important questions I'd like to ask you. And the first one being, for someone who is looking for a church, what biblical advice would you recommend to them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I feel bad even saying this, but I, I wrote a book on this. Or at least in this way, I wrote I wrote a book because I actually have been concerned about the the, the how people have minimized the importance of the local church. Mm. So for me, just the the reality or the fact that church is important is an important thing for us to communicate. And I, and I wrote a book, a little book with Crossway, simply called "The Local Church," and in that I explain the who, the what, and the why. And, and then even at the end, I give 20 questions that in three or 400 words, I answer about the basic, how do I choose a church and how do I do this? But a biblically faithful disciple making church on mission, right? Where there's a level of proper understanding of involvement and participation is just vital to the spiritual life. And it, when we're as an, being in an age of de-churching and unchurching and the growing of the nuns, um, I think just an argument for the local church needs to be made. And so I come to my church and engage in my community and see a disengagement by Christians in my community of the church and decide that you wrote it during COVID. Um, I wrote this book trying to say, hey, the local church matters and it matters for you. And it's significant to God. It's the most important institution above Above family, above country, it's the most important. I'm not telling you to rank them or to minimize one, but simply to say which ones are eternal. Marriage will not exist in heaven. There will be no other kingdom but the kingdom of God. But the gathering of God's people is so significant. And I think we need to make a case for that in the 21st century, sadly. Amen. 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 Thank you for that. And lastly, Dr. Klink, for someone who might be watching this right now that is unsaved, what is the gospel? Yeah, the gospel of John would tell us that Jesus Christ saw a broken creation, saw your struggles and mine, saw our, not just our sins of our minds, but the brokenness of our lives and conditions of our world. And he fully entered in, in every way, in the flesh, embracing it without capitulating to it, so that he could live the life we failed to live, and die the death that we deserved to die so that he could bring forth the new creation and the renewal of all things, which has already begun, but not yet. And that by putting our faith in Jesus Christ, we become shares, adopted children, participants in the life from the one who is called the way, the truth, and the life. 
and that's Jesus Christ. And we just encourage, as I have believed and you two brothers have believed, that that is what is most true in this world today.